Thanks for joining us on Capitol View. I'm Fred Martino. Up front this week, the Illinois Guardianship and Advocacy Commission is an executive state agency created to safeguard the rights of people with disabilities. I'm very pleased to welcome Deputy Director Teresa Parks. Teresa, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Fred. It's great to be here. Good to have you here. And to start off with, I want to get to the basics. Tell us more about the goals of the Illinois Guardianship and Advocacy Commission. Yes, Fred, let me uh, start out with just a very general overview of the work that we do. As you said, we are a state agency and we have a statewide presence. Uh, we have offices across the state, including offices in central Illinois, Springfield, Peoria, Champaign, as well as offices downstate in Alton and Anna. And we have offices, of course, in the northern part of the state. All of our work, all of our programs support people with disabilities and in different and unique ways. We have a program called the Office of State Guardian that serves as guardian of last resort for adults with disabilities. And by last resort, I mean, uh, we don't get appointed guardian unless the court determines someone needs a guardian somewhere in the state and there's no one else willing, available, or appropriate to serve as that individual's guardian. We are guardian for about 5,000 individuals across the state of Illinois. We also make available on our agency website, information about guardianship and the guardianship process. We have an intake number where people can call and ask questions about adult guardianship. And we put forth a guardian training module for newly appointed guardians so that they can better understand their role. And really that's a requirement now in the state of Illinois based on legislation that we initiated that new newly appointed guardians get some kind of training so that they better understand their role. We also have a program called the Legal Advocacy Service that provides legal advice and representation for both children and adults with disabilities, most often uh, in the mental health arena. We also have a program called the Human Rights Authority that investigates allegations of rights violations committed against people with disabilities by disability service providers. And then we have a special education initiative, an advocacy initiative, which is really a collaboration between two of our other programs, the Human Rights Authority and the Legal Advocacy Service. And we provide Illinois families with a resource to turn to for special education issues. So that's a very brief overview, uh, but we can discuss uh, anything in more detail. We'll get into the specifics on all of those areas uh, in our remaining time. You gave a little uh, bit of uh, information about this next question, but I want to get uh, an example, some more specifics to tell us about the conditions that would cause a guardian to be appointed for an individual. Uh, yes, uh, if someone does not have an advanced directive like a power of attorney and they are having difficulty managing their life and they're having problems making safe and sound decisions on an ongoing basis, uh, we're all allowed to make mistakes, but these would be individuals who just regularly uh, put themselves in harm's way, substantial harm's way. It may be possible that a, a guardian might be warned um, but just so your listeners know, a guardianship is a legal process. It's not something that happens overnight. It involves uh, some uh, paperwork, petitioning, a physician's report confirming that the individual has a condition that requires guardianship. And then ultimately, all of this is reviewed in a court, and it's, it's up to a judge to determine if someone needs a guardian, the type of guardianship, and then the person most appropriate to serve as an individual's guardian. And on our agency website, we actually have a booklet called An Adult Guide, a Guide to Adult Guardianship in Illinois that provides an outline of the process. And also there's a private organization out there for guardians called the Illinois Guardianship Association. And they have a booklet uh, called A Family Guide to Adult Guardianship to help families uh, review the process and the kinds of things they need to know about guardianship. 
is a family member required to start the process with you, or can it be someone who's just aware of the situation, a neighbor, a friend? Yes, any anybody can initiate a petition okay. for guardianship, and we do not assist with the process. Um, we can provide education and information, but many times families can initiate it on their own. Some families uh, seek out the assistance of a, an attorney, especially if there's something complicated uh, about the situation. Um, there are attorneys who specialize in this kind of work, um, but ultimately, yes, it goes before the judge. It's a legal process. I understand. I want to move to another issue now uh, that you touched on. Give us some examples of disability providers that the Human Rights Authority might investigate. Um, great question. Um, first of all, the authority um, in order to investigate a complaint, a complaint must meet three criteria. It must involve a person with a disability, any type of disability, any age. Secondly, the complaint must involve a disability service provider, uh, any service provider in whole or part that provides services to people with disabilities. Thirdly, the complaint must involve a disability right. And that's a right that's um, grounded in statute regulations or maybe the service service provider's own policy. We go into all kinds of settings, just to give you some examples, state-operated facilities, hospitals, including hospital behavioral health units, group homes, vocational programs, community mental health providers, nursing homes, special education programs, and even jails, because sometimes, unfortunately, people with disabilities interface with the criminal justice system, and they do have some protections in those kinds of settings. Uh, what's unique about the authority is that it is comprised of nine regional boards across the state, uh, and these boards are made up of volunteers, uh, family members of people with disabilities, people with disabilities themselves, service providers, and they come together with the help of a staff person from our agency, and they work through these complaints and do the investigations. And I just want to mention that because uh, we're often looking for people to serve on those regional boards. And if someone out there might be interested in this kind of volunteer opportunity, it's very unique, but it's very fulfilling. Um, we'd like to hear from them. We have an online application that people can access and fill out. All right. Well, uh, there is some good news here. Help is available. Uh, and, and I want to get into this now. How can the Legal Advocacy Service help individuals? Our legal advocacy service is primarily comprised of attorneys, and we do have a couple of paralegals that work in that division. And mostly what they do is they are appointed by the courts to uh, represent individuals in mental health proceedings, such as an individual is being subject to uh, involuntary commitment to a mental health facility or court-ordered treatment, usually psychotropic medication treatment. Our attorneys represent those individuals to ensure their due process protections during those proceedings. Our attorneys in that program also uh, help with questions about mental health rights and law. So if anyone out there has some questions about mental health rights, we're a resource in that program. And our attorneys also assist people with setting up advanced directives. There's a unique type of advanced directive here in Illinois called the Mental Health Treatment Declaration, which is a power of attorney specific specifically designed for mental health services. All right. Well, to wrap up, uh, you mentioned this. You have a special education initiative. Tell us about that. Yes, our special education initiative is fairly new. It's comprised of five staff. And what we do, uh, we're available uh, to answer questions about special education laws and rights. We also do training for organizations and groups. We also post on our website some online training that people can access about special ed rights and, and uh, laws. And we do advocacy. We can also assist with what is called IEP meetings. These are special planning meetings for students with disabilities. We can provide remote assistance uh, uh, if our schedule allows. And our attorney and paralegal can assist with some mediation and due process 
process cases. These are the processes available to students with disabilities if they have complaints about the services that they use. Such important information, and of course, uh, folks can find out a whole lot more about these various initiatives online at your website. Uh, Teresa Parks is the Deputy Director of the Illinois Guardianship and Advocacy Commission. Teresa, thank you so much uh, for being with us today. Thank you, Fred. It's great to be here. And we'd love to hear from you. Send us your letters. The email address is contact at WSIU.org. More news and analysis now with our guest, Andrew Adams of Capital News Illinois and Jason Pisha. He is director of the Public Affairs Reporting Program at the University of Illinois Springfield. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Andrew, uh, Illinois has spent more than $500 million to help immigrants arriving in Chicago, and now it appears that we're, there will be a discussion of more funding during the session. Capital News Illinois looked at a number of issues being raised as more than 34,000 immigrants have arrived in Chicago from Texas alone. Tell us some more about this. For sure. So obviously how to support these people has been a top of mind issue for local leaders within the Chicagoland area and also state leaders. Uh, like you said, the state's already spent over $500 million. That's uh, through a variety of means, uh, 470-odd million through uh, various agencies and another $160 million through this kind of comprehensive plan that Governor Pritzker rolled out in November. Now, that money goes to helping uh, fund caseworkers, helping fund shelters, helping uh, put on legal clinics, but that money will run out eventually. Those services can be expensive. So there have been discussions in Springfield about uh, what to do next, what to do for the coming year. House Speaker Chris Welch uh, last week formed uh, what he's calling a working group, an informal group of lawmakers who can meet with advocates and draft legislation, uh, something he's done for other controversial political topics. Uh, the abortion rights working group comes to mind. Now, I'm interested in what that working group will put together uh, for a couple of reasons. Chief among them is one of its members, Representative Jahan Gordon Booth, a Democrat from Peoria, who is the House's chief budget negotiator. Uh, so if there is a large spending package, either through this year's uh, projected surplus or through next year's uh, standard budget, uh, Representative Gordon Booth is on a short list of people who would likely be at the decision-making table for any of those kind of financial decisions. It's really something, uh, Andrew. Yesterday I was reading a story in the Chicago Sun-Times and uh, they reported that the city of Chicago only budgeted $150 million for this crisis. Uh, and they're going through f about $40 million a month. We have not independently confirmed those numbers, but that was in the story. That gives you an understanding of why I would imagine it's likely this is going to be discussed extensively, I would imagine, during the, the session. Yes, and the uh, relationship between the city and the state becomes contentious at times. This week, uh, Mayor Brandon Johnson, the mayor of Chicago, said that uh, Chicago has uh, carried the entire weight of this crisis, even though the state funds many of the services uh, and has given uh, at least $115 million over the past 18 months to the city specifically for this. Uh, now, they just rolled out a new plan, a new uh, approach to the situation, one that shifts focus away from uh, offering these migrants shelters and more towards either hotel living or connecting them with family or rental assistance. And the state has already uh, shown some, some issue with this, with Pritzker saying he was deeply concerned by this approach. And of course, uh, the governor uh, writing uh, a, another letter with some other uh, governors this week, 
uh, expressing to the, the Congress that a border bill needs to be passed uh, to have relief. Uh, I want to move on to, uh, to another aspect of this that I found very interesting this week. Uh, Jason, Chicago and New York City have both sued bus companies dropping off immigrants from Chicago or, or in Chicago. Uh, it turns out uh, that uh, filing the lawsuits will not be the only expense. Now a bus company is suing Chicago so that it, it appears the city will have to fight a lawsuit as well. Bring us up to date on this. Sure, earlier this month uh, in, in January here, uh, you know, as you know, um, a lot of the 35,000 or so migrants that have made their way to Chicago uh, are getting here via bus, uh, buses that have been hired by the state of Texas uh, to transport those migrants here. Um, the city of Chicago, uh, to deal with the influx, has put in uh, several rules and regulations on uh, where these buses need to drop off migrants, what time of day they uh, can do it. Uh, there has to be associated paperwork that goes along with it. They just can't drop them in the middle of nowhere at three o'clock in the morning and say, I'm good. Um, the one bus company, uh, Wind Transportation, filed a lawsuit against the city earlier this month. Uh, saying that uh, these rules and uh, this treatment of migrants uh, violates various aspects of the U.S. Constitution. They filed this in federal court, of course. Um, you know, they're arguing that, uh, um, you know, the federal government has uh, regulation over immigration in this country, and the city of Chicago cannot in essentially make its own immigration laws and, and regulate how uh, these, these uh, migrants are, are brought into the country. Um, they're also claiming that uh, the way the migrants have been treated uh, violates their, their, their rights as, as humans, uh, calling it uh, an inhumane operation. Um, that some experts said in this story that uh, they're a little bit nefarious on that claim, just based on the fact that uh, no migrants are named in the lawsuit as plaintiffs. It's just this bus company uh, going up against the city. Uh, I guess if they were you know, truly worried about uh, uh, human rights violations that they would, uh, you know, get some migrants in on the lawsuit as well. Um, it'll be interesting to see where this goes. A, a lot of the constitutional claims in here, if you read through the lawsuit, I, I found it interesting that uh, some of the cases that the plaintiffs used to bolster their case uh, related to uh, interstate shipping of products, including apples and beer, uh, whether you can compare those things to uh, transporting migrants across state lines, uh, I guess the court will, will have to check on that. Okay. Very interesting. And again, something we'll continue to, to watch as it uh, develops uh, an issue for Illinois, many other states, and, and the entire nation as well. Andrew, while Illinois is spending hundreds of millions of dollars on this immigration crisis, it is making cuts to a program for some of the state's most vulnerable citizens. A story from WCIA says that the Department of Human Services is planning to cut the number of hours it covers to care for the developmentally disabled by nearly 9%. Tell us more. So this is uh, just to get the kind of facts out there to make sure we know what we're talking about. This is a, uh, a reallocation of how DHS, the Department of Human Services, uh, spends its money. Uh, they reimburse uh, providers for uh, giving care to people with intellectual and developmental disabilities at a number of facilities throughout the state, all of them supported on some level by, by DHS. Now, like you said, this is about an 8.7% cut in the number of hours uh, that they will reimburse for. Um, and uh, just from what I've seen, that's about $90 million overall in uh, savings from the state. Now, this has been a long time coming. It was initially announced last January, January 2023, but its rollout has been delayed several times since then. And it came to a bit of a head uh, in the past few days here because it was met with 
uh, vocal opposition from some Senate Republicans at the State House, notably Senator Chapin Rose, a uh, Republican from Muhammad. And you know, those criticisms uh, are mostly along the lines of it being what they view as a, a cynical or even a hypocritical move from the governor's administration, um, particularly contrasted against the increase in the wages the state will reimburse for these direct service providers, the uh, care workers that are working on the ground in these facilities. Last year, the state upped their pay by $2.50 an hour, it's $2.50 an hour. And now they're cutting the number of hours they'll reimburse for. So uh, this has led to the opposition from uh, Senate Republicans in particular. And it'll be interesting to see if this becomes uh, one of those things at the State House that uh, kind of catches fire and becomes uh, a, a hot political topic. Okay, another thing to watch. Jason, uh, we move now from Illinois cuts to additional spending by the state. Illinois is investing heavily in companies that make products for electric vehicles. The governor's office announced another $122 million for a tax credit for a German firm making copper and copper alloy, alloy components found in electric vehicles and other products. What did you find out uh, from an article on this by Capital News Illinois? Yeah, um, you know, as you know, the, the state of Illinois is, is all in on renewable energy product or projects and products, uh, electric cars and, and everything that goes along with that, solar energy. Um, and uh, they have been working very hard to bring companies that build components and, and deal with these issues to Illinois uh, to help build our economy here in, in this state. Um, there was a, an announcement uh, a few days ago, Whelan Rolled Products North America um, will get uh, looks like $122 million in uh, subsidies over the next 30 years uh, to expand their operation here. As you mentioned, uh, that's a, a firm that makes uh, copper parts, many of which are used in electric vehicles, which, you know, as you know, is another goal of the state to get more electric vehicles on the road over the next several years. Um, Again, this is uh, um, you know just more of the state's uh, investment into this issue. Uh, you know, very important for uh, you know as we we worry about climate change and uh, the uh, supply of our, our coal reserves and uh, everything else related to that. Yeah, I found this story really interesting, Jason, because the story said that this company was making uh, an investment of about five hundred million dollars. Uh, in addition to this 122 million uh, over 30 years, there were additional incentives and that the total was over 200 million uh, from the state. So uh, not quite half of this $500 million investment, a lot of money that we're talking about here. And this is not the only one, as you point out, there are other companies that are getting subsidies and tax credits. Yeah, and as you mentioned, in, in this particular case, this you know total of 230 or so million over, over the life of this uh, deal, uh, this will go to modernize this company's uh, facility in East Alton that produces these products, uh, and also will, will retain 800 jobs that the company and the state claim. Yeah. Um, and, and like you said, this is, the, is not the only deal that this is happening, and in not all cases there's you know, there isn't always, you know, big state subsidies on the line either. Um, yeah. I think Andrew had a story this week that, uh, uh, you know, looked at a solar company that's uh, expanding in Illinois as well. Yeah. What did you find out, Andrew? Uh, yeah. So uh, Nexamp, the, uh, and they say they're the largest provider of community solar power in the country, uh, has opened up a second headquarters uh, in Chicago and it's coming along with what they say is going to be $2 billion of investment in the state. They're hoping to make Illinois their largest solar market, which uh, aligns with the Pritzker administration's climate goals uh, quite closely. Certainly, uh, I'm sure the state uh, hoping for uh, lots of offshoot 
uh, economic development from this and certainly income tax uh, revenue as well. Uh, we will see as this, this all develops. Uh, Andrew, we just have a couple of minutes left, but I didn't want to miss this story. The Biden administration has been really successful reducing prescription drug prices through legislation, and now Illinois may try to do that. Lawmakers have introduced a bill to create a state prescription drug price oversight board. Tell me about that. Of course, uh, the bill from... Representative Syed and uh, David Kaler would uh, create a five member board that would have oversight over uh, particularly pricey uh, drugs, both name brand and generic. Now, uh, this would be new for us and advocates say that it would be beneficial, particularly for folks like seniors who have a lot of medication, uh, but it is not the first, uh, we would not be the first state in the country to try something like this. Eight other states have similar oversight boards to varying levels of uh, success with uh, uh, different nuances in some of the details. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see uh, where this goes and if it yep. can pick up wind. We'll be watching Andrew Adams of Capital News Illinois, Jason Pisha. He is director of the Public Affairs Reporting Program at the University of Illinois Springfield. Gentlemen, thanks for being here. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for joining us at home. For everyone at WSIU, I'm Fred Martino. Have a great week.